Well, hey, everybody. Good morning. If you weren't here at the beginning of the gathering, I just want to say hi and welcome. It's so great to be together today as we etch into March here and uh, into the spring season. Uh, it's just crazy how time is going. And here we are again online. So it's so great to have you guys with us. I think we have a great morning um, planned together this morning. We're going to continue in a couple minutes in our series through Song of Songs, which has been beautiful. There's just been some great feedback just about the major themes that we've been kind of wrestling through. And uh, I'm, I'm particularly excited about this morning and I think where God's going to lead us as a community. Um, but as you know, every week we take time just to open our mouths and read the Psalms together. And we're going to do that again. It's already come up and it's going to come up here. Uh, Psalm 19. And my prayer is just that we pray this together. This is for us to help lead us in our prayer. And uh, the beautiful thing about coming to the Psalms every week is even when we don't know or have things even that kind of spring up from us in prayer, we have something from thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago that can, that's been, you know, ink put, put, to, pa um, ink put to paper and um, is for us now thousands of years later to use. So let's, let's use this today. Psalm 19, let's say it together. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. Like a champion rejoicing to run his course, it rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. I love that, that in the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. Father, we just come to you knowing your creator, sustainer, and God, we lean into this, we trust you in this, that you hold everything together. And in, in the chaos of our moments, uh, in the chaos of this time with the pandemic and lots of political upheaval, lots of theories and theoretical stuff and how things should be done. We just are this community that leans in and trusts you. In the chaos, we trust you. The one who has pitched a tent in the heavens for the sun, this image of you holding everything together. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters today that maybe feel like you're far off or distant. distant. May you just reveal yourself more and deeper as we come to the scriptures, as we come to your word, as we come to community, that everything that's said and done would be for your glory here. We thank you, God, for today, for giving us your word, giving us your son, King Jesus, and giving us each other. And I pray that you would just move in all those things today, in Jesus' name. And I hope you can say with me, friends in cyber world, amen, amen. Well, so good to be together. Let's do this. I know it's kind of awkward at times, but let's take a minute. Let's uh, turn on our cameras in the Zoom world. Say what's up, give us a wave if you're out there. Hello, hello, what is up? Hi there, few waves here and there. Good to see you. So great, so great. Yes, well, a uh, few things, a few things. I'm Again, I've already said I'm excited about this morning. A few things uh, that, in particular, in the community coming up and some things that have happened, we just wanted to bring you up to speed on. One, we just wanted to say thank you to everybody who participated yesterday at Arc Aid. We had an opportunity yesterday again to serve a meal, prepare and serve a meal at Arcade Mission downtown. And well done to everybody that participated. We were able to make just under 200 meals and just really, again, thankful for this partnership with Arcade. They have been pushed to the limits during this season of COVID, uh, having to give out tons and tons of meals. Not only that, many of you guys know that there's two WISH, they're called WISH, um, uh, uh, temporary housing that's been built during COVID to house those who are houseless and they're temporary kind of shelters. And so some of the meals that we prepared as well, I think about 60 of the meals went to those shelters as well. So well done to those that serve. But I just wanted to say as well, you know, if you contribute to Praxis, 
um, every time we do this, it costs us about seven, not costs us, but it, it, the, the expense on it is $700. And I just count that a joy. So even if you have been able to serve, contributing week in and week out to our community, um, we have really committed to putting our budget towards this. And so we were able, again, to help 200 people with meals. That's pretty fantastic. And that's just part of our local mission here and local vision. And so that outreach is really, really beautiful. So thank you, thank you, amazing. And it was awesome as well to see kids involved. I think one of the things that some of the folk at Arcade were really, it brought them joy yesterday was seeing kids serve with parents. Such a beautiful thing. I was uh, chatting with one of the guys there and I just said, listen, we do things as a family. I'm not, I hope it's okay that the kids came. Obviously they love that. But I just said to him, like, we want to do this as a family. We want to model this for our kids. So. Well done. A um, couple things. One, next Sunday, it's kind of a big Sunday for us. Next Sunday is our 10 year celebration. And so we're going to put pause on everything and gather together and just celebrate 10 years. Now, our story is a little unique because on March 13th, 2011, we started as City View Church, which was a location of a church in town called Royal View, as many of you know. And we kind of started working in partnership and together as a location of that. And then it wasn't until a couple years ago that we actually launched out as an autonomous church and we rebranded and called ourselves Praxis. So we have this unique story. Are we 10 years old? Well, kind of. Are we two years old? Well. Yeah, that too. But um, one thing we really felt is it is the 10 year Sunday from starting as uh, City View, which is hard to believe. A decade has gone by. And we do want to take some time to celebrate the past and all that God's done over these years and months. And then as well, just take time to look to the future. And so we're really excited. I hope you can gather with us next Sunday at 1030. And we're just going to join in and reflect a bit. Now, in the mail this week, you are going to receive at your door in the mail a little gift from us. Everybody in the church, every household and everybody in your family is going to get in the mail a coupon for a free cupcake at a local business here called Hey Cupcake. Uh, they're located in West Five here. and. We just sent that out. We just want to encourage you to use that. That's a little gift from us just to celebrate the 10 years and all that God's done. And uh, so maybe when you get that this week, you want to go grab a cupcake. It's obviously redeemable for about a month, but that's just a way for us to say thanks to you guys and uh, a way for us to celebrate, though we can't be kind of in the same room quite yet together. So we're excited about that. But the other thing is this, after our little celebration next week, we're also going to hold our annual meeting. Not only is practice a church, I think you know that, but we're also obviously have a uh, government um we're a government not-for-profit and so um, one of the things that we have to do each year is have, hold an annual meeting with our membership and so after our celebration next week we are gonna have our annual meeting for all members now if you're not a member we actually want to invite you into that just to let you know the member language I always have to preface and we always preface is not like hoity-toity language it's not like separating people nor are we a country club not at all it's just a language we use that for people that have kind of come into partnership and membership uh, as part of the kind of the legal entity that is Praxis Church. And so we want to extend an invitation to use those of you that maybe aren't members and would, and would want to be. All you have to do is go to mypraxis.church slash membership. There's a covenant form there. And again, even with the covenant form, I'm always telling people, this is not something for the church to lord over you at all. It's just a way for all of us to enter into uh, a type of commitment towards each other and towards God in community. And so you can just fill that out and we'd love to have you a part of our annual meeting next week, next Sunday after. What will happen is we'll take some time in that meeting to share the financials from 2020, share a few things that happened as well as give the proposed budget for 20. 2021 and to have you involved with that. So again, we're trying to make this not scary at all. And I know some of the language can sound scary. It's not at all. We'd love for you to do that. Now, some of you last year thought maybe that you entered into membership, but you didn't because our membership form is very uh, close to our volunteer form. And so if you have not received an email about the meeting saying that you're a member, you're probably not yet. So all you need to do is just, again, go quickly to that site, mypractice.church slash membership, and you can jump right in with us. Again, it's going to be a great time together. Excited about that. So our 10-year celebration next week, our annual meeting, it'll be a great way to bring everybody up to speed and kind of look to the future and what God has for us as a community. And we're just so thankful 
for all y'all. As my friend Angie and Jonathan in the States, in the steep south would say, all y'all. We just are so thankful for all y'all and what you bring to this community. With all that said, um, we're gonna jump right in. As you know, we are right now in the Song of Songs. It's been a little spicy over the last couple months here. And if you've been a part of things, you also know that one of the things we've been doing is kind of bouncing back and forth with a co-teach between myself and a guy named Mike Erie. Mike's a great guy. And uh, he's been leading us through some of these teachings in the themes in Song of Songs. And he's gonna come back today. There's been great feedback. This has been so good. And we felt like in this environment, we could use some video along the way. And so we've been looking at the major themes of Song of Songs and the ideas that come with it and wisdom, timing, character, all these things uh, about sex and sexuality, but even the deeper layers that come with this discussion. It's such an important talk. So we encourage you to open your Bibles to Song of Songs right now. Open up with me. We're going to uh, jump right back in in a second here. As well, we wanted to put again a PG-13 kind of rating on this, if that's okay. Um, we are going to again talk about some obviously real stuff, necessary things to talk about, but there will be some topics and different things again that we just want to, as parents, we want you to be prepared for. So if you have a children or students, totally up to you and what you want uh, them to engage if they're with you. But I uh, just want to put that out there. But we're going to invite Mike to come and he's going to teach us and I'll, I'll give some instruction at the end for us. So here comes Mike. The Song of Songs, chapter one, verse nine. He speaks. I liken you, my darling, to a mare. That's a horse among Pharaoh's chariot horses. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. Now, gents, if you want to try this verbal affirmation, you may want to clarify a little bit because um, Pharaoh uh, was the a ruler of Egypt, of course, and had many, many horses. Uh, they, they, the most sort of prized horses were horses uh, that were stallions. Uh, because they, you could breed them and take them into war. And, and so when he talks about a mare, he's talking about something like you would have lots of stallions, but you wouldn't have many mares. At least that's the idea. And so he's speaking, he's telling her that she is something of great value. She is priceless. Um, you, you might want to update the image a little bit, but that's, <laughs> that's kind of the idea. And, and then she responds, she says, while the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of En Gedi. And you know, we're re so removed from these sort of affirmations, you kind of go, okay. So he compares her to a horse and she compares him to flowers. And you know, Back then it would have been, but notice, I mean, notice, this isn't the language of, of science, it isn't the language of medicine, it is the language of poetry, it is the language of romance, right? There's a sense in which, um, fellas, that if you don't learn this language, you, you kind of miss out on a woman's greatest sex organ, which is her mind, her heart. She wants to be romanced and wooed. And there's a sense in which, you know, um, there was a study done several years ago that, that one of the biggest indicators of whether or not a relationship would survive was the r ratio of positive statements to negative statements. And that, and that they could predict whether or not a relationship would make it based on how positive the conversation was or how negative the conversation was. And so one of the things you see in this couple is that they are just incessantly affirming each other with such beautiful poetic language. You, you're like Pharaoh's mare, and you, you are like henna blossoms. And you know, we kind of go, ah, but there's a principle sitting behind it where they just keep reminding each other they're so valuable, they're so romantically inclined and connected. He responds, how beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful, 14 times. In these poems, he calls her beautiful. Remember, she said, I'm lovely, yet I have this insecurity part of me, right? And so he just affirms, 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 affirms. You're beautiful, you're beautiful. Your eyes are doves. They bring peace and gentleness. She responds, how handsome you are, my beloved. Oh, how charming. Our bed is lush. Verdant is a way of saying it's fruitful. It's lush. And you can read into that whatever you'd like. 
He says, yes, take in that image. The beams of our house are cedars. Our rafters are like firs. I mean, all of this image, you're sitting here going, okay, no one speaks to each other this way anymore. And that's true. But, but you know, you would update it a little bit, but the power of the simple back and forth, the affirming of desire, the affirming of not only physical beauty, but the way they are as people. He affirms her character. She affirms his fragrance, his name. If you remember all of the images that we've been talking about, they just keep going back and forth. Chapter 2, verse 1. She says, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. And those, and notice she just says, she doesn't say I'm the rose of Sharon or the lily of the valley. She just says, I'm a common flower. There are many like me. He interrupts, no, 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 no. Like a lily among thorns is my darling among the young women. Right? So she, she begins to just say, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm lovely like a flower, but there's lots of flowers just like me. He says, no, no, no. And guys, this is a good one. Like a lily among thorns, are you among the maidens? She responds, like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my beloved among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade. And remember, we talked about that several couple weeks ago, where she had the biggest insecurity came for her being scorched from the sun. Well, this is a guy whose shade she delights to sit in. So he, he covers almost her biggest insecurity is the image. And then there's this line, I delight to sit in his shade and his fruit is sweet to my taste. And we'll just kind of move on from that one. <laughs> Let him lead me, but it's referring to what you think it's referring to. English, by the way, English doesn't, it doesn't do some of this justice. There, there's some things in there that you'd go, okay. Um, let him lead me to the banquet hall and his banner over me is love. We used to sing this song, uh, his banner over me is love. He brought me to the banqueting table. And the image is, is a bit more erotic than kind of the song made it out to be. Uh, <laughs> I stopped singing that song after I started studying it. Uh, she says, Strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with lovemaking. The idea is apples and raisins were aphrodisiacs, and she's exhausted. And so she says, I need strengthened because this is exhausting. And, and then she says, his left arm is under my head, his right arm embraces me. And the word embrace means caress, and it doesn't mean like caress her face. It means caress body parts. Daughters of Jerusalem... Right, this, this chorus, these friends, she says, I charge you by the gazelles and the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Now, you may be going, what, is the, what in the world is going on? This book is a really hard book to study because it's built, uh, uh, it, it's, um, to use a literary term, it's chiastic, which is not a sexual term. It, it, is, it is, chiastic means there's a parallelism to it. It talks like the, the book talks theme A, and, and then it talks about theme B, and then it talks about theme C, and then it goes back to theme B, and then it ends with theme A. So there are parallels slotted all throughout the book. And so we're in a section now where they seem to be recounting the earliest parts of their relationship. And, and, and in these poems, we see a couple of things. Number one, if you study the book as a whole, they, you see them interacting in all sorts of different situations. Number two, you see them unbelievably affirming of each other. And number three, you see them full of sexual desire, but there is some restraint displayed. In other words, this is a book not about the sex act, but about the desire for the beloved. That's what the book is. The sexual stuff is just the outworking of the desire part. If you read the whole book, and I encourage you to do it, if you read the whole book, the whole book is full of them yearning for each other. And infrequently, those yearnings are met, and then they're immediately followed by this statement. I charge you by the does and the gazelles, do not arouse or awaken love until it can be fulfilled. And so the way the book seems to unfold is yearning, 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 yearning that waits for an appropriate release. And after the release, there's this sense 
Listen, this is such powerful, majestic, beautiful stuff. Wait until it's proper time. The book is not in any way, shape, or form anti-sex. It's just timely sex. In other words, yearning, 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 fulfillment. It's so intoxicating. It's so powerful. Do not wake it up lightly. That's the idea. And so their words get more and more sexual. They start hinting at different sex acts they want to do to each other. Then there's fulfillment. And then she says, after she says, I need food. <laughs> she says, she says, this is so powerful. Don't wake it up. Now, there's another way to understand this. In fact, there's some commentators that say uh, that what this text actually means is it's so exhausting, make sure you've got plenty of time. And, and maybe that's what she's saying. It's certainly consistent with some of the things, but, there, but there's another sense that, that these, she says this three times throughout the book, and it's always right after fulfillment. And so I, I kind of tend to think that what she's saying is, listen, it's so powerful, it's so adventurous, it's so majestic, don't wake it up lightly. I think that's what she's getting at. Now, this is what we've been doing through the series, as we launch out of Song of Solomon into other parts, because the song just stirs up questions and, and thoughts and like, okay, really? So I want to talk about the difference between normal sexual desire and lust, because the book is full of normal sexual desire. And one of the things we're saying is sexual desire isn't a bad thing. We were sexual before, in the Bible's words, we were sinful. And so you just see this, oh, I delight to sit in his shade and his fruit is sweet to my taste. You know, refresh me with raisins and apples because I'm exhausted. I need more sustenance. I mean, the, and, and this is in the Bible. And, and what, usually when we preach this kind of thing, it's, you know, we kind of neuter it a little bit. But it's all sitting there and it's saying, listen, sexual desire is not the problem. The corruption of sexual desire is the problem. And for far too long, we've not said, listen, is the desire for food bad? No. But it's the corruption of the desire for food. Is the desire to make money bad? No, but it's the love of money that's the issue, right? So we've got to separate the desire for the thing and the corruption of the desire for the thing. And so we want to talk about the difference between these two people saying, I want you, and she's saying, I want you, and him saying, well, I want you too, and this is what I do, and this is what I do, and the Bible not shaming that, and yet there is this thing that is called lust in the scriptures, that the scriptures talk a lot about how do you know the difference? So let's explore that, Genesis chapter one. All right, so you'll see that almost all the time we go back to Genesis. Um, because so many, I mean, you, you take a conversation about homosexuality, you take a conversation about sexuality, and what ends up happening is you just pull all of these Bible verses out and say, here, here's what the Bible says about it. That isn't the, the most legitimate way to have the conversation because the Bible says a whole lot of other things too. There's a grand story that is being told and sexuality is invited to be a part of that story. You can't just rip out the verses and say don't because the story doesn't unfold that way. Jesus doesn't walk around just saying don't. Jesus walks around waking people up to a higher level of righteousness than people dared possible. He would look at Pharisees who prided themselves on never committing adultery and say, you know what? I'm so glad that you guys are proud that you're not committing adultery, but you realize the issue is lust, right? And that's in your heart. Or he looked at people who were so proud that they weren't murdering and he'd say, well, you realize the issue is anger, right? Anger is what gives birth to murder. Lust is what gives birth to adultery. Jesus kept zeroing in on the heart as the issue. And you can't moralize your heart. Only the gospel revives a heart, transforms a heart. The good news of Jesus isn't try harder. Try, just don't masturbate anymore. Just don't look at porn. Stop sleeping around. If that's what Christianity is to you, it's not Christianity. That's not Jesus. Jesus does something far more radical. So we'll talk about what that is. Genesis chapter 1. In the account, verse 26, God says, 
Let us, remember there's this rhythmic poem that's being said over and over and over. Uh, God said, let there be light. There was light. It was good. God said, let there be this. There was that. It was good. God said, let there be that. There was that. It was good. And then it, that whole sequence gets interrupted. Genesis 1. God said, let us make mankind. It means humanity. It's generic. In our image. In our likeness. So they may what? Rule over the fish in the sea the birds in the sky, over the livestock, all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that what? Move along the ground. So, God looks at all that he has made and he says, you know what, there's nothing that bears my image. Now, to be an image bearer, as we've talked about, means that however faintly you echo, human beings echo bits of what God is like. We're not animals and we're not angels. The goal is to be fully human. So, we have human desires, and human frailties, right? We weren't made uh, as animals or angels, and yet we can't pretend that those desires aren't real, right? So, so the, the world just simply looks at us and says, hey, the kids are going to do it, so give them condoms, as if biology was the most important thing. And then the church at times just looks at everybody and says, oh yeah, we're angels, we don't struggle with this stuff, and all of that sin and abuse and hurt goes subterranean. We just want to say, no, no, God said, you're image bearers, you're human, and part of what that means, the first of the 613 commandments of the Bible was fill the earth and multiply. So sex was part of the original intention that God had for creating human beings. And that male and female were both image bearers. That meant they were of worth, significance, and value simply because they were made in God's image. They were made, it says, to rule. Now when it says rule over the fish of the sky, or the fish of the sky, the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over the livestock, over all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. Here's the idea. Rule doesn't mean strip mine, pollute. It doesn't mean uh, hunt into extinction. Okay, the word rule there means to cooperate with God in the administration of the created order. It means to be, and, and, and we don't have time to look at all of the theology that sits behind this, but it, it means to be God's co-regents. His, his, like, we're the, we're the landlords, right? He owns the building. We're just the, the building managers. And do it in a way that brings glory and honor to God and benefits all of creation. That's what it meant to rule. Human beings weren't angels. They weren't animals. They were fully human, and part of their humanness was to be in partnership with God, creating and directing and managing creation towards God-honoring ends. Makes sense. Now, this is the part where we meet the talking snake. Okay, now, if you're here and you're like, I don't buy the talking snake. Okay, that's just fine. Let the talking snake be a metaphor to you or whatever. All right, but we're going to talk about the fall narrative that involves a talking snake. And whether or not you buy it, it's okay. There's, there's a profound point being made, all right? So flip over to Genesis chapter three, verse one. So God creates Adam and Eve. He nestles them into a garden called Eden, right? The word means delight. He's given them food to eat, He's given them each other. He says, be fruitful and multiply. That chapter 2 ends with they were naked and unashamed. I mean, it was a pretty sweet deal. There was only one rule. Remember what the rule was? What? Don't eat of this particular tree. You can have everything else, but of this particular tree, don't eat. Okay? It's a garden full of yeses and there's one no. So we meet a serpent. Verse 1, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now notice what he's doing. In a garden full of yeses, there's one no. So what does the serpent draw their attention to? The one thing they can't do. She replies, 
to the serpent. Verse 2, we may eat from the trees, uh, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it. Now, God never said that part, or you will die. What does the serpent say? You will not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. In other words, God is jealous. God doesn't want you to be like him. God's holding out on you. God isn't good. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, she, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. They realized they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, this is the significance of the story. Human beings were to rule over creation, and instead, a piece of creation invites the human beings to submit to its wisdom rather than the Creator's wisdom. So instead of being over creation, now human beings stand under it. They give away this call to rule, and instead, Their authority is usurped by creation itself. Forget about whether or not you buy the talking snake. The point is that creation is now reversed. Instead of human beings partnering with God in the administration of justice and mercy and grace and whatever else over the created order, now human beings have listened to creation instead of ruled over it and now find themselves alienated, separated, right, from God and from each other. The first thing they do is they sow fig leaves, they realize they're naked. That is an indication they felt shame. The second thing they do is they hide from God. They fear Him now instead of being intimate with Him. In other words, everything that God designed initially that was characterized by a Hebrew word called shalom was now ruptured and fractured. The human being's relation with each other, with creation, and with God all now was fragmented. That's why this story is called the fall. Because their disobedience wasn't just that they screwed up and God was angry, but it was they abandoned their place in the created order. And now are tempted to worship and serve created things rather than the Creator. Are you with me on this point? Okay, this is incredibly important for the story, and about 14 of you nodded your heads. (laughs) So I'm assuming the rest of you are dazzled. Now, to help make a bit of sense of this, I put together, well, I didn't put it together. I had somebody who's graphically designed put it together. A little, a little thing right here. This is the toilet bowl of horribleness. <laughs> or the tornado of sin or something like that. All right, but I, I want to show you, I want to show you the way that this temptation went. All right, because there's a flow to it. And interestingly enough, wouldn't you know it? Thousands of years later, we still face the same temptations. No yawning. There's a whole bunch of yawning going on. This is designed. That was you right there, both of you ladies. No, it actually, it actually started over there and it spread. I watched it like the wave. It was like the reverse wave of horribleness. As I was unveiling the tornado of sin. So, all right, so... It starts, how did the temptation narrative start? You have a garden full of yeses, focus on the no. In other words, focus on the one thing you can't do rather than all the things you can do. The Bible's word for that is just simply ingratitude. Right? You got a whole garden. You're naked and unashamed. Be fruitful and multiply. You can do anything. Just don't eat of the tree. So what do they say? Must eat of tree, right? Right? We're still this way. You can have a wonderful life, but there's one thing you can't have. What do we fixate on? The one thing you can't have. Right? So, it starts with ingratitude. It moves to idolatry. And here's the key. The key that the tempter says to this woman is, God is holding out on you. He's saying, if there's a no at all, God isn't good. Do you understand that's what he's saying? 
If there's any no anywhere, God isn't good. And who's going to know better? Who's going to know better? Me. Right? Do you see this connection? There's a no. And if there's a no, God isn't good. Why? He's holding out. If he really wanted us to thrive and be like him, he would allow us to eat. This is what the serpent is saying to the woman and to the man, fundamentally, right? He says, did God really say? Draws immediate attention to the no, and then says, God knows that if you eat of it, you'll just be like him. What's the implication? God doesn't want you to be like him. He's holding out on you. Idolatry is simply obeying something other than him, giving your allegiance to something other than him. So they say, I think you make a great point, talking snake. Let's, take, let's go your way on this one. And so then they step out, and this is the funnel effect. They step out in something called immorality, and that's a big old Bible word that just means transgress, transgressing God's boundaries. And how do they step out? The best, way to, the best way to step out in disobedience is to deny the consequences. What's the serpent say to them? You won't die, right? And then lastly, if you keep going, this big, wonderful word, imprisonment. Now, that is epic. That the funnel plus the red writing just <laughs> makes the point, doesn't it? And it's red for sin. You understand this because it's the tornado of sin. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Someone took a picture of that, and I just went, I, how, what do you... Well, here's what I learned at church tonight. I mean, how do you even make sense of that? So, imprisonment. Now, this is so important, you guys. Stay with me. How does God punish them? Does he lock them in to something bad, or does he lock them out of something good? In this story, prison means being locked out of something bad. Good. So the story continues. They're sent into exile. Now, keep this tornado of whatever in mind and go to Romans chapter 1. And this is going to come back to Song of Songs, all right? Are you still out there? Was there a no? Because we can, we can exile you and put a flaming sword and if that, that is something good. All right, I'm tired. Do Romans 1. Now, Romans 1, verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. How about that for an opening sentence? Right? For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so people are without excuse. Now this is Paul's way of saying, listen, there is nobody that can shake their fist at God and say, I didn't have enough reason to believe. Now, there are all sorts of people who will say, well, we don't have enough reason to believe, and I get that, but Paul's argument to the folks of his day is that, listen, God has revealed himself. All you have to do is look out the window. He's revealed himself through what has been made. Now listen. Verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Now Paul is going to talk about the general condition of people called Gentiles, all right? These are non-Jewish people, and he's going to describe kind of this spiral that they're in. He says, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor what? Gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God to worship images made to look up like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Now notice verse 24. 
Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They exchanged the truth about God. Do you see that? The truth about God. Not about sex, but about God. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Right? And then he goes on to talk about how those shameful lusts play out. Go to verse 28. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind uh, so that they do what ought not be done. All right, now there's a whole bunch more that he says, and we'll look at it later. But do you hear language that's very reminiscent of the temptation narrative we just read? Do you see that? I mean, if you were paying attention, fire up the red glory, you saw the same spiral, right? What's the first thing he says? They, although they knew him, they neither glorified him nor gave thanks. Now, would you agree that we as people are incredibly ungrateful, just in general? Would you agree with that statement? Absolutely. If you're single and you want to be married, Right? You're unhappy because you're single. If you're married and you want to be single, you're unhappy that you're married. Right? It's almost like any, any station of life you find yourself in, there's another reason to complain. Right? So it's like you get married and then you go, oh, but this is the only naked body I can look at for the rest of my marriage. Right? I mean, it's like no matter what blessing sort of comes, I mean, we are people who are fundamentally ungrateful people. And that's just, part of that is being human, part of that's being raised in America, part of that is being a consumer. We are trained to be consumers. And you understand that every advertisement is designed to make you unhappy with your station in life. You understand this, right? So we have a mar- this, this temptation has a marketing department. Right? It, we are clearly and incessantly bombarded with the desire to be dissatisfied with where we are, what we look like, what we do, what we smell like, and what we have. There is an incessant negotiated desire that says, if I just had one more thing, if I just got married, if I just got divorced, if I just could have sex, if I could just do this with my mate, if I could just do that, I mean, there is an incessant, never ending stream of, if I could just. Fill in the blank. And so Paul says, you want to know why people are alienated from God? I mean, you could, you could be a single person who is incredibly gifted, does meaningful work, has massive amounts of friendships, but what's the tempter going to keep, keep pegging you with? Ah, you're not married. You could be dating, have a beautiful relationship, Right? And, and, and clearly, this is somebody that you feel like you could spend the rest of your life with, but what's the tempter going to hit you with? Ah, but you can't have sex yet. And so that's what you focus on. Or you're married, and you have a great marriage, but what's the tempter going to focus on? Yeah, but you can't sleep with anybody else. I mean, every step of the way, the whole world system, empowered by our adversary, just simply says, do not be at peace. There's something more for you. And if you just had that. And we all know this, but it's the air we breathe. How do you critique air? Right? How do you, if if you're a fish, how do you know anything other than water? Unless you're a fish of the sky. (laughs) Right? I mean... It is so, we are so immersed in it, we can all go, yeah, 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 we know advertisements are dumb. And yet, so we live, Paul says, in a world where we may know God, but we neither glorify him nor give thanks. We live in a garden full of yeses, and all we ever focus on is the no, right? So when we talk about sex, what does everyone want to talk about? The no. Well, why can't we? Where's the line? How far can we go? Right? We just, we don't want to focus on the yeses. I mean, how great is it to feel attraction? How great is it to feel desire? How great is it to flirt? How great is it to whatever? We don't want to talk about that. We just want to talk about the rules. And then we get bitter. Because where do we go next? 
If there are rules, he's not good. I mean, he even says that. Paul says that directly. They exchange the truth about God. We're not even talking about sex yet. He's talking about your view of God. Listen, do you think God is good? If you do, place sex into that. If you think God is not good, how you view sex will be entirely different. It's about, this isn't about sex, it's about how you see God. That's where the battle's really fought. Is he good and loving and kind, or is he mean, vengeful, and wrathful? And so the temptation comes, hey, there's a no. There's a no out there. Immediately, well, he must not be good. And who's going to know better? Me. Sex worship is self-worship. That's all it is. The, the, the most common object of worship in American culture is self. The isolated consumer self. So anything that frustrates self-desire is deemed oppressive, repressive, bad. Jesus says, you know, there's a self you got to deny if you want to follow me. So you have two completely different versions of human life. But notice how ingratitude feeds idolatry. If there's a no, he can't be good. Well, there are no's. Well, he must not be good. Who's going to know better? Me. And how do you step out and transgress? Deny the consequences. Is there no more fertile place for denial than in the area of sexual sin? It's not hurting anybody. It's just a website. Nobody's going to know. I mean, I, I had a guy tell me with a straight face, Christian marriage. He says, listen, man, it doesn't matter if you look at other menus as long as you eat at home. Now, ladies, does that, do you think that qualifies under the broad category of fidelity? Okay, so he's attracted to other people, but you're the only outlet he's got. I mean, that's just, really? And what's the rationalization? Not sleeping with anybody else. Hey, honey, let's bring some porn into our marriage just to spice it up. And that is the most damaging thing you can do. If you can't find satisfaction and attraction with each other, the last thing you want to do is add more naked images. You, you want to focus on, you want to, you want to go back to being attracted to each other and not needing all the other naked images, right? I mean, there is no more fertile ground. Hey, it's not an affair, but we just spend lots of time together, Right? I mean, is it, is it me? Or are we masters at this? And we deny the consequences. So, the spiral is, there's a no. God must be good, bad, he must not be good, I know better, and it won't really hurt. This affair, <laughs> this one will meet my needs. Right, I screwed up the first one, this one's gonna be awesome. And then you realize, and I've talked to people who've done this. Oh, the same set of problems that plagued your first marriage is here too. That's shocking. Because wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> right? So what does Paul say? They neither knew God nor glorified Him in gratitude. They worshiped and served the created thing. See, rather than the creator. We're all worshipers, brothers. Do you understand worship has nothing to do with singing? Worship has to do with your allegiance. Who do you listen to? Who do you follow? Who do you want to emulate? What code, what ethic, what example drives the decisions you make with your real life? That's worship. We want to make it about singing songs. See, worship isn't a religious activity, it's a human activity. And sex worship is just another form of it. And so Paul simply says, listen, if you want to know, if you want to trace the spiral, go back to your view of God, and that'll tell you who you worship. And most people worship themselves. That, of course, leads us straight into violation of whatever, whatever boundaries God has set up, and we do that by rationalizing that they, they aren't so bad and it won't really hurt, and this is actually better for us. Until we find ourselves back in the red diagram of horribleness, until we find ourselves right there. Imprisonment. Now, three times, if you were paying attention, Paul describes the prison that people find themselves in. Did you hear the phrase? 
God what? Gave them over. Now, we understand, listen to me, we, un- we misunderstand the nature of God's judgment. We think God is judging us when we get a disease or when she gets pregnant or when we get caught. I'm telling you that's his mercy. His judgment is found precisely in those moments when he lets you have what you want. Giving you over is another way of saying, I won't interrupt you. I won't stop you. I will let you have what you want. See, we think, oh, no, 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 we got caught. She's pregnant. There's a disease. We think that's his judgment. I'm telling you that's his mercy. His judgment is found precisely when he just says, okay, if that's what you want. And one of the things he says we're given over to are shameful lusts. Now, the word lust is a really interesting word. It comes from a Greek word that means in the mind. Lust starts here. Thoughts that are dominated by craving. Is lust just a sexual thing? Is lust just a sexual thing? No. You can lust after alcohol. You can lust after material things. You can lust after food. You can lust. What do you obsess over? What do you fantasize about? What occupies your thoughts? That is what lust is and where it begins. Now, all of us are somewhere here, right? I mean, my guess is there are some of us who feel the weight of imprisonment. I mean, and I've talked to some of you. I want to stop and I can't stop. I'm addicted is our language, right? But that's just another way of saying you're in prison. Some of us are in the middle of acting out. We're people that, yeah, we kind of know it's wrong, but we don't think it's too bad. Some of us are, and, and maybe you're not just one. Some of us, we just can't say no to ourselves, in which case you run your life. Or for some of us, we walk around as just incredibly ungrateful people. The point I want to make tonight is simply this. Our sexual problems don't just start and end with our sexual problems. There is a bigger story being written about how you see God and his purposes for humanity. So how does healing come? Does healing come through trying harder? Does it come through trying harder? Does it come from feeling more ashamed of yourself? Does it come from staying quiet? No. Healing comes first and foremost when you come out of hiding and you realize there is no temptation that has overcome you except what is common to the rest of us. No matter how twisted you think you are, there are a whole bunch of people just like you. Two of the most powerful words human beings say to each other is me too. Me too. So healing starts with coming out of hiding. Healing starts with understanding who God is and how good he is. Healing comes from recognizing that you can't run your own life and learn to really worship and serve this creator rather than you. And healing comes when we realize there are consequences and it does matter. Well, brothers and sisters, um, lots to chew on here. Lots of things to uh, wrestle through, um, as always, with the kind of the key and major themes here. Um, ho- hope you can hang with me just for like two minutes. Um, we're not going to jump into groups today. We'll take some time. This has gone a bit longer. I just want to take some time just to pray over our community. But um, there's lots here, and I think these are the types of conversations that we need to have as a community when we talk about these things. The under the layer type of conversations where we were created in a world of yes and yet there's this continual pursuit from the adversary to focus on the no, right? And uh, even just the picture of God keeping them out of something good, um, I think Tozer, I know this is a um, a paraphrase, but A.W. Tozer talks about um, how uh, how we think about God is the most important thing about us. And I often think about the reality that well, how we think about sex often shapes how we think about God, but also how we think about God shapes how we often view sexuality. And 
These are important things as we talk about sin and the world kind of turning in on itself in these areas. And we all know the world is broken in these areas and looking at God's design and heart for his people. Um, what I would love to do for us in amongst all of this is just pray a prayer of healing for us today and pray over us. Um, I think of our community and just, I know the, the continual wrestling through some of these things. Um, I would just love to pray for us. So listen, I know we're all over the place, but if we could just open um, our, our hearts right where, where you are, and maybe that's a posture of just opening your hands to receive today, but I'd just love to pray for us. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. Thank you for my brothers and sisters. I pray healing, God, on us in our community, on our lives, on, God, what you want to do within us. And I just pray that, God, you would open us to what we've heard today. And maybe no matter where we're at on that little diagram in, in our own journey, God, may our hearts just be drawn back to you. There's so much religious jargon around some of these issues. I just pray that the heart of the, that what's happened today would just be this continual picture of you, God, and how we think about you is the most important thing about us because, God, if we come from this posture of you being good and having good things for us, we begin to see, God, that you've created us with a purpose and a plan and your intentions are good. I pray that we would lean into that. That would mark our community. And maybe for some of us that have distorted views, these little ideas that can creep in, may you just draw us back to right thinking so that, God, we can go into this world and live right where you've called us. I pray grace and peace on this family. I pray, God, that you would just have your way in us, God, as we go out and we live this in the world. I pray these things in your name, King Jesus, knowing you're good. And I hope you can say with me, brothers and sisters, wherever you're at, you can say amen to that today. Amen. Awesome. Well, again, we hope you can join us next week, everybody. Uh, our 10-year celebration, it's going to be a great time. And uh, it, we're just really looking forward to taking some time just to reflect. We're not going to go into groups today. It's been, a, it's been a longer morning. Why don't you have an amazing weekend? We'll release you into the wild of your day and just have an amazing day. We love you. Grace and peace to you all. We'll see you soon.